Hey guys, welcome to That Florida Feeling. How is everybody this week? It's been good. Still hot. Kind of rainy. It's fall, but of course, if you're in Florida, that means nothing. Although I'm jealous. Like, friends that live in other states that are actually getting, like, to wear sweaters. I mean, like, one weekend would be nice before January. Just saying. Thanks to everybody who's interacted with all the social media pages. You guys are awesome. The Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and TikTok pages are rocking. Thanks to you guys. Okay, maybe not YouTube. That's a work in progress. But just, just give it time. We're getting there. Uh, you guys are awesome. Can't thank you enough for helping make this podcast successful. Um, again, shout out to Bob for coming on last week. He was amazing. He's such a cool guy to talk to. I hope everybody gets a chance to like flip through or pick up a copy of his book. Uh, he's got some amazing tips about... Uh, fishing in Florida, and yeah, you just got to read, especially if you like fishing. Thanks to everybody who participated in the poll in question. Apparently, we all like history podcasts the best, and we decorate a little bit for spooky season. You guys are my kind of people. Um, I know I asked everybody for suggestions a little bit ago, and uh, the topics you really wanted to learn about, and I got a bunch some that I wasn't expecting, some that I hadn't even thought of, and so thank you for those, and I got this one. I actually got a few for the Seminole Wars, um, which is on my list. I've already done the first Seminole War. It was probably late July. Yeah, probably July. I think July. It's been a month or so. Um, I got some tourist places. I got couple people and I got this one and this is a person who made a huge impact on Florida's history in fact so much so that a lot of Florida is somehow named after this person and I am talking about Osceola um the person who has literally counties towns streets cities everything named after him high schools you name it it's gonna have Osceola's name on it but who was Osceola Osceola was actually born in 1804 in village, uh, excuse me, in a village in Alabama, a creek village to be specific. His name was Billy Powell at the time of birth. Um, and I, I don't know why I always think it's strange, I guess, to hear that a creek or a Seminole had such a white sounding name. And I don't know if that's part of my ignorance, and it could be, that they had just normal sounding names. To, to me, because, you know, part of my family's from Kansas and everybody we met had more what I guess I perceive as Native American names. So forgive me if that sounded ignorant, but to me that just sounds so strange that his name was Billy Powell, just like a normal sounding name. Osceola was born in the area of what today is Tallahassee, Alabama, which is on the banks of the Tapusa River. The village he was born in was a mixture of people with ethnic backgrounds, as a lot of villages were in that time. Um, white settlers were moving in, um, and the Native Americans were trying to survive. Now, the Muskogee Creek were one of the ethnicities as well as black slaves that were in his village. And Powell is actually thought to be a mixture of these slaves. They know his mother to be Polly Copringer, a mixed-race Creek woman, and his father might have been William Powell, who was actually a Scottish trader known to this area. Now, Osceola's mother was actually part Muskogee and part European, as her parents were Anne McQueen and John Coppinger. The Muskogees used the maternal kinship system, so that meant that Polly and Anne's children were born into the mother's clan, and that was who they represented, and that's who they gained their social status from, as opposed to what most people think of as the paternal father side of the clan. Now, Anne McQueen was actually a mixed-race Muskogee uh, Creek. Her father, James McQueen, was also Scottish, and Anne was a close relative of Peter McQueen, who was a prominent Muskogee leader and warrior. So that meant that Billy, or Osceola, um, and I'll refer to him as both, would have been raised in the Muskogee Creek Confederacy as the relative of a prominent leader warrior. Now, Osceola's grandfather was James McQueen, um, and he was actually the first known white person to trade with the Muskogees all the way back in 1716. He was known for being a ship-jumping Scottish sailor who worked in the area of Alabama. He stayed in the area mainly as a fur trader, and he married into this Muskogee family, which is how he remained so involved in the Muskogees and their trade and daily life. Um, McQueen was buried in an Indian cemetery in 1811 in Franklin, Alabama. 
1814 brought changes to the Muscogee people of the area um, as the Red Stick Muscogees were defeated by the U.S. forces. And again, this is white settlers moving in and wanting land. Um, the defeat that caused Polly to take Osceola and move with other refugees from Alabama to Florida. And this is really where you see more tribes joining the already growing Seminole tribe. So um, I know I talked about the Muscogee, state of Muscogee and other things and the Seminoles in a previous podcast. And it really is a mixture of Creeks and Muscogees and Seminoles and Blacks and, you know, anybody kind of an outcast who didn't fit in and, and could join the tribe is what really made up this growing, massive Seminole tribe. Now, Powell was officially given the name Osceola as an adult in the Seminole tribe, so he will now be Osceola to us. The name is from the word Aussie, which means black drink, and Yahola, which means shouter, so black drink shouter. Um, so, to me, this means that he was probably a really good warrior and really loud at the same time. The Seminoles were living in Florida up until 1821 when the U.S. acquired Florida from Spain during that trade where now um, Florida is officially a U.S. territory, which means that they will be taking over. The acquisition of the lands also meant that more white settlers were going to come to Florida and move in on these already uh, debated lands, the Seminole lands. So Osceola and his family moved further south into the unpopulated areas of central and southern Florida. And you've got to remember, at that time, Florida had St. Augustine, they had Pensacola, they had uh, St. Yeah, Mark's, where the another fort was. And then you had, like, Fort Brook near Tampa. And then you had Key West, where the pirates hung out. And then you just kind of had people spotted around. There wasn't really huge cities like you think of today. Osceola took two wives as he grew up, and he had a couple children. Osceola had one black wife, um, and it wasn't really uncommon for high-ranking Seminoles or Muscogee leaders to have multiple wives, and he, of course, did. Osceola was actually known to be fiercely opposed to the enslavement of free people. Osceola's other wife was named Chichoter, which means morning dew, and she gave him at least four of his children. So he had multiple wives and multiple children, and he was fierce about defending their freedoms. Now, in the 1820s, as U.S. gained Florida, more settlers obviously began immediately moving into the area, and the settlers were pressing the government to remove the Seminoles from these lands. They wanted their lands, and they wanted to settle Florida and use it for agricultural development. So in 1832, a few Seminoles had signed the Treaty of Payne's Landing and agreed to give up Florida lands for the lands west of the Mississippi and the Indian Territory. And this is really during the First Seminole War, or what really led up to the First Seminole War. Um, Now, Osceola is threatened to have stabbed the treaty with a knife as opposed to signing it. Um, You can actually still see a small knife cut on the treaty today. Uh, Unfortunately, that is legend. But if you can see a small knife cut, uh, you know, most of the time legends come from... A very small sliver of truth. So five Seminole uh, chiefs, including McCann... I cannot say this, and I never have been. McCannopy? McCann- Somebody's yelling the correct way to say it right now at the podcast. I know it. McCannopy of the Alachua Seminole. He did not agree to this transfer or removal of land rights. Um, in fact, five of them did not. The U.S. didn't like that they weren't giving in, so they sent uh, U.S. Indian agents and other people to really work with the Seminoles to see... One, why they wouldn't leave, what the problems were, what they could do to make it move along. But the Indian agent that really worked with the Seminoles, it was known as Wiley Thompson. Um, And Wiley Thompson, for all intents and purposes, sounds kind of like a dick, honestly. Uh, He had these chiefs taken from their positions, the, the, the five Seminole chiefs that did not want to agree. And the U.S. Seminole relations were all but deteriorated at that point. I mean, you're talking the Seminole Wars happening, and nobody's getting along, and nobody likes each other. Thompson also stopped all sales of guns and ammo to the Seminoles, um, just as the war started to progress. And Osceola actually resented that ban. Uh, Osceola felt that he was starting to equate the Seminoles as being nothing more than slaves. Now, Thompson and Osceola actually had a really interesting relationship, and... They were honestly considered close, if not more than acquaintances, definitely closer to friends. Um, Thompson liked Osceola, and he actually gave Osceola a rifle. Osceola, on the other hand, in turn, was known to barge into Thompson's office shouting complaints. 
Um, I'm not saying it was one-sided. I'm saying that they didn't understand where they stood with each other. And, of course, one time Osceola took it too far. He um, barged into Thompson's office. It sent Thompson over the edge, and Thompson arrested Osceola, had him locked up at Fort King for two nights until he agreed to be more respectful about his issues. Now, this did not sit well with Osceola. I mean, you can imagine nobody did. We were supposed to be able to talk about things. I'm bringing you my problems, and you throw me in jail. Actually, Osceola said that it felt more like a slap to his face. He was embarrassed. He was mad, and he was embarrassed. And at this point, he was going to prepare for vengeance against Thompson. Um, the imprisonment is what is said to be the thing that ruined that, um, I would say, thin ice friendship at best. Um, no more acquaintances, no more friendships. You have wronged me in Osceola's eyes. So, on December 28th, 1835, Osceola got his vengeance. He used that same rifle that Thompson had given him to kill Thompson and men with him. Osceola and his followers actually killed six people outside of Fort King while they were also uh, having an ambush and killed over 100 troops, which were marching from Fort Brooke to Fort King. It was a simultaneous attack, and it proved a point. The event that killed the 100 men would be known as the Dade Massacre, and these two attacks are seemingly what started the second Seminole War with the U.S. So, in that small sliver of barely managing peace, when Thompson was an Indian agent trying to keep the peace, um, he's also the very thing that ruined it. And I know in both men's eyes, they probably thought they were doing the right thing. April of 1836 saw Osceola lead another band of warriors to take over Fort Cooper. The fort was built on a lake and used as an outpost for actions against the local Seminoles. The U.S. garrison there was low on troops, but managed to keep the fort from going to Osceola. They did hold their position, but that did not stop Osceola. He was not going to be let down by one simple uh, loss. He continued to fight the war. He felt as the Seminoles were not being treated as citizens, and they were not going to become slaves. Osceola and his band of followers, which amounted to about 80-ish, um, were finally captured on October 21st, 1837 by General Joseph Hernandez on the orders of General Thomas Jessup. Now, Osceola's capture is very debatable um, for many reasons. Osceola and his band of followers were actually under a white flag of truce as part of peace talks at Fort Payton near northern, in the northern area of Florida. That meant that there were no shots going to be fired. That meant that they were coming to talk and that no one was going to be taken prisoner. That is not what happened. Osceola was taken with his followers under a white flag of truce and arrested. Osceola was captured and held at Fort Marion, which is today known as the Castillo de San Marco in St. Augustine. And he was held there before being transferred to Fort Moultrie on Sullivan's Island in South Carolina. Now, of course... Osceola's capture made news. It also made news for the wrong reasons. Um, it actually caused a huge uproar because it was seen as an actual treacherous act by Jessup. The act was under a white flag of truce. You are not to do that. And he did exactly what he should not have done. And many, many, many people were mad at this man. Um, the act and administration actually was condemned for, by Congress and vilified by the U.S. and the international press. Um, everybody knew that under a white flag you were supposed to talk and walk away, and that is not what happened, and many saw Jessup as almost a coward for capturing Osceola this way since he couldn't capture him out in Florida. Um, Jessup did suffer, though. He suffered the loss of a reputation, and it followed him up until the day he died, which personally I think it should have. That is crap. Osceola was literally coming to talk to make things better for the Seminoles and to even try to see what they could do to end this second Seminole War and he was captured. The act of arresting Osceola under a white peace flag was called one of the most disgraceful acts in American history. American military history. Um, and it's still called that to this day. Now Osceola and his men were visited by many people at Fort Moultrie. Um, he actually even had his portrait painted as a way to preserve history. That portrait is the same one you see um, going into Osceola County at the high schools on the road signs. That is Osceola. Um, when Osceola was captured, though, unfortunately, he was extremely ill. He had a um, abscess, which caused him to be very ill. 
Osceola developed a friendship with Robert John Curtis, um, and that was also one of the people who was allowed to paint his portrait. Um, but he became friends with him as he was held at the fort. He would visit him. Curtis and Osceola talked during the painting sessions, and Curtis actually painted two oil paintings of the warrior, one of which is believed to be the one that we see all over Florida to this day. Osceola was suffering from chronic malaria in 1836 when he was captured, and this led to acute tonsillitis, which caused him to have an abscess. Um, he knew that he was close to death in the fort, and he asked the doctor, whom he had also grown close to, uh, Frederick Whedon, to promise him that he would be able to return his body to Florida where he could rest in peace as he considered that home. Whedon, it didn't say if he made the promise or not. Um, unfortunately, Osceola died of Quincy, which literally is an abscess of the tonsil, on July 30th, uh, 1838. Um... Not long after being captured, because he was captured, what, uh, October of 1837, and he died January of 1838, so yeah, not many months afterwards, um, but of course, always having this chronic malaria from the 1836 to basically the entire war and fighting, and this led to his body just giving out. Um, Whedon did not keep his promise or be nice to Osceola, in fact, Whedon is the same man that cut off Osceola's head and buried Osceola's body in South Carolina. Whedon is said to have taken the head to St. Augustine, because everything weird goes to St. Augustine, and kept his head on display at a drugstore. Yeah. The head was apparently kept there until 1843 when it was purchased by Valentine Mott, who has a collection of heads. I mean, how ever was this acceptable? Like, genuinely, however, was it acceptable to just have a collection of heads in jars? Really? Okay. Osceola's head was said to have been lost after Mott's death, so honestly, nobody knows where Osceola's head is anymore. Of course, Osceola's legend didn't die with him. Uh, he has numerous towns in different states named after him. Florida is home to the Osceola National Forest, as well as lakes named after him. He is the symbol for FSU in Tallahassee. That is Osceola and the Seminoles. Osceola did have, um, he actually had a descendant live into the 21st century. Um, in fact, they just passed away a couple years ago. Chairman Joe Dan Osceola lived from 1936 to 2019, and he was an ambassador of the Seminole tribe. He was Osceola's great, great, great grandson. So it is kind of cool that Osceola's, uh, legend truly did live on, for someone who helped make a difference in Florida. Like I said, though, unfortunately, Osceola was not treated correctly in death. Um, Whedon did remove his head before the funeral. And not only kept his head, but he also kept other objects belonging to Osceola. A brass pipe and a silver concho, which is like a belt, um, were kept after Osceola's death. Captain Morrison of the U.S. Army, who was in charge of transporting Osceola and other prisoners, also took a few belongings. Um, evidence also suggests that Morrison made the death mask of Osceola when he died. Um, he had Dr. Benjamin Strobel uh, create the death mask, and it is still around to this day. We didn't obtain the head right after the funeral. It is believed that he opened the casket, cut the head off, took it out, left the scarf, and sealed the coffin before anybody else could get back to it. The Smithsonian Institute actually has some of Osceola's belongings and the death mask is in the loose collection at the New York Historical Society. Which I hate to say this, but I feel like that's one of those things that um, probably should have come to Florida. For whatever reason, it just feels right. Osceola, no matter how, time his short, how short his time was, did make an impact on Florida. He also made an impact on the Seminoles and the Second Seminole War. Um, I thought that... I honestly thought that the way people talked about Osceola, he was around a lot longer. Um, especially with all the importance he holds during the Seminole Wars, with all the stands he made, with all the, if you ever study, which I do have a podcast coming up about the Second Seminole War, with all the impacts he made just in that war, it, it felt like Osceola lived to be an older man. Um, it didn't feel like he got cut down very short due to a very stupid act by one captain who was just trying to get ahead, but doing it all the wrong ways. Osceola fought for his beliefs and his tribe right up until the end, and I wish he had been treated better in the end um i can tell you if anybody wants to haunt the this grounds it's probably osceola 
I also do know that there are a few ghost stories about Osceola. Um, they do say that you can possibly see Osceola's head floating around at the fort in St. Augustine. I don't believe that one. I don't. I really don't. Um, because Osceola wasn't there long enough. I really, he just, to me, that doesn't seem like a place he would want to haunt. Um, of course, I don't know if that's true. I've never seen it. I've never actually heard anybody that's seen it. Um, but he definitely seems like the one person that has the right to haunt people after he passed because of how he was treated. We're not going to talk about Florida Man today. I feel like Dr. Wheaton is his own version of Florida Man for doing something incredibly stupid as a human being just to gain fame off someone else's death. That right there sounds like the perfect Florida Man to me. All right, guys, I really appreciate you listening. I hope you learned something new about uh, Florida or about Florida history. Um, now that I know that we all do like Florida history or history in general, maybe I'll start incorporating more of those episodes in. If always, As always, if you have somebody you want to be a guest, if you have a topic you want me to research, if you just want to say hi, if you, I don't know, just reach out and say hi. It's fine. It's great. I love you guys' suggestions. I love that you guys interact. Keep sharing those memes on Facebook because, sadly, most of them are true. Like, that's really how Florida is. Um, by the way, guys, I just heard Florida is full. Please stop moving here. Not really, but it feels that way. Thank you guys so much for listening. I hope everybody has a great week. Happy fall, even though that means nothing to us. Um, as always, guys, that's your daily dose of sunshine.